I'm delighted to be back. Uh, it's a wonderful occasion, and thank you, Sally and uh, Ray and uh, Karen, for making this such a, a great uh, learning experience for so many people. Uh, I was asked, I usually talk about an artist or a writer, and I was asked because it's the 25th year to talk about an issue that is actually very, I wouldn't say near and dear to my heart, in the sense that anyone who has mental illness knows what stigma is like and knows what discrimination is like. Um, I'm not going to give a talk that is database, and you will see that in, that in your handout, uh, partly because I can't tell you how many meetings I've been to and all of my colleagues have been to on stigma. I mean, there are more stigma meetings than you can begin to imagine. They, they are almost invariably incredibly boring meetings that next to never go anywhere. Everybody agrees that stigma exists and everybody agrees that stigma is a bad thing. Um, and next to nobody talks about what to do about it except to some gen general nuzzlings in the direction of public education. Um, and that's very important to educate the public. But there's really not a lot of evidence that that works nearly as well as we would like. So what I'd like to actually show in these two slides, uh, one slide is from the, uh, a, a large survey done by the Royal College of Psychiatrists, just showing what everyone knows, that people have um, some I ideas about depression that many of us wish people didn't have. But the first slide I want to show is that despite the fact that we've made a lot of progress in educating the public, that these illnesses, uh, mood disorders and schizophrenia, are illnesses of the brain, that they're genetic, that they're, quote, neurobiological. Um, as you can see, we've made a lot of uh, very significant progress in the last 10 years in, in educating the public to that effect, but no progress in destigmatizing uh, the illness. So the question is, what's going on here? Um, in fact, that the, the people's unwillingness to work closely with people with mental illness with serious mental illness to socialize with them, to make friends, these are self-perceptions, of course, uh, remain about the same level as they did 10 years ago, despite the fact that people's notions of the ideology are different. So the question is, we've put a lot of time and effort into trying to convince the public about the ideology that these are medical conditions like any other, um, but does it make a difference? And this is just the study that I alluded to from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and they asked the public, um, about um, a, a very large sample of uh, 2,500 plus, what their perceptions of people with uh, severe depression were. And as you can see, and I want to get back to this, the number one thing that they saw about people who had depression was that they are unpredictable. And I think unpredictability is going to uh, play into people's fear and concerns about all aspects of mental illness. Um, and about a quarter of people regarded them as dangerous. Uh, if you get into diseases like uh, schizophrenia and bipolar illness, of course, those figures will go up. Stigma by its nature is neither ra rational nor fair. Newspapers and television stations, for example, can print or broadcast remarks about those with mental illness that would not be tolerated if made about any other minority or disadvantaged group. The journalists would lose a job immediately. You can write things like wacko, nutcase, fruitcake, and you can say them on national television and there's absolutely no penalty whatsoever. Stigma insinuates its way into policy decisions about access to health care, health insurance, job discrimination, and research priorities. But those who have mental illness also stigmatize themselves. They do not or they cannot demand of their lawmakers the health care systems which they deserve. Their expectations of society are low and not consistent with a large voting block they represent. Such self-stigmatizing has dam damaging consequences. It inhibits acknowledging illness and indeed recognizing it. And it decreases the odds of seeking treatment and it makes less likely the acceptance of treatment. The inability to discuss mental illness in an informed and straightforward way, to deal with it as the major public health priority that it is, is unjustifiable in the 21st century. There is stigma against mental illness within the clinical community as well, from the doctors, psychologists, nurses, and social workers who have had no serious cause until recent years to examine their own beliefs because their professional communities have not thought it important enough that they do so. Most clinicians are compassionate but not nearly as well informed about mental illness as they should be. 
There's another group that contributes, albeit unwittingly, to the stigma, and that's a group I like to think of as the silently successful. These are people who get well because they've had good clinical care and because they are beneficiaries of a first-rate research enterprise, but who are afraid to speak out about their mental illnesses for fear of personal or professional reprisals. This is completely understandable, but it's unfortunate, for it perpetuates the misperception that people with mental illness do not get well. As a result, what remains in the public eye is the great mass of untreated people, or un in in inadequately treated mental illness, the newspaper accounts of violence, the homeless mentally ill, and the untreated mental illness that people see in their friends, family, and colleagues. What is not seen is all of the people, the computer programmers, lawyers, successful businessmen, teachers, secretaries, physicians, politicians, who have been successfully treated, who show up for work, who compete, who succeed, and who live good lives. Everywhere I go in the United States, in city after city, on university campus after university campus, I see the suffering of those who do not avail themselves of treatment because of stigma. So what can be done about stigma? And I think that's the only issue, um, is really what can be done. Uh, can we really change it? Can we make a difference? The first thing I would say is find another word. The word stigma stigmatizes. It implies there's something to be stigmatized. The word discrimination, on the other hand, has a satisfyingly legal ring to it. Second, it is essential to understand why stigma exists. Just stating that stigma is wrong and that people ought not to stigmatize those with mentally Ill, illness is not enough. It won't work. It won't change the way things are. Thus, the study of animals teaches us that animals discriminate against those who are odd and against those who show even very, very subtle types of differentness, whether it's in their languages or in their behavior. Perhaps there are ancient hardwired reasons for fear and discrimination. We, like other animals, fear that which is unknown, unpredictable, or potentially dangerous. The emotional, financial, and physical costs of mental illness can be exceedingly high to family members, friends, and colleagues. It is not benign to those who are directly affected by it, and to expect endless understanding is probably unreasonable. Legitimate concerns must be discussed forthrightly, much more so than has been done to date. Third, and relatedly, patients and their family members need to recognize their political strength. This is something I've been struck by time and time and time again. Unlike the AIDS community or the breast cancer community or people suffering from other, other kinds of cancers or heart disease, we don't speak out nearly as, as much. And we're a really large voting group. We're a significant percentage of the population. We are a very, very, very large block of voters. Fourth, we need to start our efforts against discrimination by working within the medical and mental health communities. There needs to be more honest and intelligent discussion about mental illness with the ranks of those responsible for treating the suffering of others. We need to make it easier for doctors and students to receive good psychiatric care without being professionally penalized for doing so. We need to teach by example that mental illnesses are common, painful, potentially dead and deadly but also that they can and should be treated. Finally, we need to convey to the public as well as to our colleagues how extensive our scientific understanding of mental illness is. We know a lot, and I'm struck time and time again when I'm talking to the um, public or to students how everyone thinks about psychiatry and psychology and neuroscience as kind of fuzzy-wuzzy and sort of vague and into the ethers and how little appreciation there is for the really excellent science, uh, much better science than in, in many other parts of medicine that underlie our understanding of the diagnosis and treatment of our illnesses. Public perception about mental illness lags decades behind what science has taught us. We should campaign on a positive note, try to captivate the minds of the public about the excitement of neuroscience, brain research. We're fortunate to live in a time when genetics, brain imaging, and the development of new treatments have radically changed the lives of those with depression and bipolar illness. Research is, has been, and always will be 
the potent destigmatizer. I'd like to end with a few personal remarks about stigma. I have taught in academic psychiatry departments all of my professional life. And as someone who's also suffered from a severe form of bipolar illness, I've been acutely aware of the kinds of jabs, jokes, and wounding stereotypes that mental illness brings out in many people. Yet it was only when I wrote a book about my illness that I became truly aware of the extent of discrimination that people with mental illness face. I received an astonishing number of letters, many of them quite psychotic and frightening, from people who fear or hate the mentally ill who raved on about the terrible manic depressives they had known. Others told me that I deserved my illness because I had not been a sufficiently devout Christian. <laughs> Which may be so, but I don't think that's what caused my <laughs> mental illness. Uh, yet others said that I had no business writing, teaching, or seeing patients, despite the fact that my illness was well controlled. Several colleagues, not here at Hopkins, I might add, because I have had nothing but extraordinary support here uh, that I will always remember and appreciate. But several colleagues uh, outside of Hopkins made it clear that it would have been best for me to keep my illness private. Of the many thousands of letters I received, some of the most difficult to read were those from doctors and other health professionals. They recounted their own experiences with depression and bipolar illness the lack of support they had received from their mentors or colleagues, and too often their dismissals from graduate school, medical school, or residency programs. All expressed the concern that it was hard to be straightforward about mental illness when their academic degrees, medical licenses, clinical referral sources, or hospital privileges were at stake. Most people, though, although still frightened and misinformed about mental illness, know much more now than they did even five years ago. Public education campaigns and the widely advertised availability of effective medications and psychotherapies have made a definite impact on public attitudes. But all of us need to recognize how vulnerable so many of our family, friends, and colleagues are and reach out accordingly. Then we need to reach out to the rest of society and to let them know that we will not tolerate the intolerable, that we will not tolerate the kind of pain and discrimination that has gone on for far too long. Thank you. Well, I've said other times when I introduced Dr. Jameson that her success in her career and then her honesty about her illness is one of the biggest things we can do to fight misinformation about bipolar disorder. And I think that is true. And I'm sure you all have lots of questions for her, so I will look to the audience. Dr. Joshi. The question is, to this day, we have uh, medical licensing forms that say, have you ever been treated for mental illness? Actually, that question, interestingly enough, is not so allowed as it used to be. The question that is asked, and certainly is asked here, and I think is a perfectly legitimate question, is do you have an illness that might interfere with your capacity to practice? That to me is a perfectly legitimate question. Um, no one has the right to practice, it's a privilege. And it's a, a, a major issue is what do you do with impaired clinicians? You can't have impaired clinicians treating people. On the other hand, these are common conditions. Uh, if you got rid of everybody in medicine or clinical psychology who had depression or bipolar illness, you'd be in bad straits. And um, so you've got, the, the question is always, how do you figure out how to make the incentive one, the, these are treatable disorders, how do you make the incentive one so that people will seek out care? And, and what we tell the medical students here is, you know, look, a lot of you are going to get depressed. That's life. That's just the nature of it. It's, these are common illnesses. Um, you're not responsible for getting depression. What you are responsible for is getting treated. And there's no excuse in this day and age for not getting treated and for not keeping a wing out for your colleagues and making sure that you're doing everything possible if somebody else needs treatment to get into treatment. But some questions are particularly legitimate and some of them are, as we know, a little questionable. Yes, the question is, perhaps attitudes have not changed because the illnesses themselves have not changed. I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's, again, where you just, 
it, it, there's something to be said for just being direct and dealing with the truth and as, as we find it. I mean, one of the things, for example, pe people don't like to talk about is violence and mental illness. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you look at the studies, 50% of people during acute mania engage in at least one act of physical violence. Uh, family members know that. Patients know that. Uh, it's not stigmatizing to say what is true. It's stigmatizing to say, you know, to make a large number of generalizations. And what we also know is if people are treated, that rate goes down to the population rate. So, you know, I think that when people are treated, people have very different views. And so, you know, of course, when people see untreated illness, they continue to have those perceptions because people, when they are depressed, are unpredictable. You know, anybody who's been depressed, anybody who's been around anybody who's depressed. I mean, life's unpredictable. I mean, lots of things are unpredictable. It's not just depression, but depression's unpredictable. And so the, the question is, what can you do to, to educate people? And one of the things that, for example, Dr. Schwartz and her colleagues have done brilliantly in starting in the Baltimore area in the private and public schools and then across the United States and now going internationally is just try and educate uh, high school students and middle school students in a straightforward way. These are the symptoms of depression. You know, you may get depressed. Teach this to the, to the students, teach it to the parents, teach it to the faculty, to the teachers. And say, you know, so that, then if that child goes on to college, and all of a sudden is sleeping all the time, is irritable, thinking about suicide for the first time. They're not encountering that for the first time. They've, they've been educated about it. So I think that's what, what we can ask for. The question is, is, your daughter has a mood disorder and has been advised by all of her, and she's doing very well, has been advised by all of her uh, health care professionals to keep quiet about it. Um, yeah, you know, there's a certain amount to be said for circumspection. I mean, people ask me a lot, as you can imagine, because I've gone public about my own illness, um, should I go public? And I think that's something that, you know, people may decide it's a good thing to do, may decide it's not a good thing to do. But for sure, it's something you want to think about long and hard. Because once you've done it, you're out there. And some, a lot of people are really understanding, and a lot of people aren't. And it depends a lot on what stage of your career you are, what kind of career you're in. Um, and I think that it's the sort of thing where people just need to talk about it a lot. I mean, it's unfortunate, I think, at any time to give the message to anyone that they have something to be ashamed of or to have to keep quiet about. That's a very separate issue from giving the message there are certain practical consequences of saying certain things. You know, and so you want to make it very clear. I try and make that distinction. It's not always um, a, a good one, you know. But a, a lot of people have gone public, have been immensely helpful. And our, our um, person that Dr. Schwartz is going to be interviewing this afternoon is is someone who's been very, very, very helpful to thousands and thousands of people. And there's no doubt that that can be done. And I, I'm a great believer in people going public. But I also believe that people ought to be quite circumspect about it. And the question is, what do I think about the, the um, use very frequently in the press of the, of the word schizophrenic to imply contradictory thinking? Um, you know, I think it's uninformed. You know, um, I, I think that that's, it goes on all the time. I suppose I'm a little bit more concerned when I see the wackos and nuts and fruitcake sort of things that I see all the time in the Washington Post and the New York Times which to me are, you know, as good, good case of journalism as you're going to get. And it happens all the time, you know. So I, to me, I, I just don't understand how we allow that to happen. And I'm tired of writing letters to the editor. <laughs> uh, the question is, do I have um, any advice about the advisability of sharing one's uh, psychological problems, issues, diagnoses with patients. Um, I actually was trained in a very conservative way of psycho, I mean, actually trained by analysts, psychoanalysts for the first two years of my training life. And I have to say, I, I didn't agree perhaps with uh, a lot of what they taught, but I, I did inherit the view that you keep a distance. You know, you're there, you're there to treat patients, uh, not for them to deal with their notions of your problems. And, and so when I wrote An Unquiet Mind, one of the things that I knew I would have to do uh, was give up my clinical practice because I had written such a private book. I don't, you know, now people vary. You know, a lot of psychotherapists talk about a lot of very personal things with, with their patients. I just, I'm not of that school. I really believe people have a right to walk into your office with a certain assumption of anonymity from their therapists. Um, 
but that's, you know, I'm, as I say, people would vary from that. No, I, I can, uh, the question is, don't you think that your ter temperament or personality determines uh, whether or not, to some extent, you should make the decision to go public, whether or not you can take the heat? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think there's no question. I mean, I'm, I mean, one great thing about being in academic medicine for so long is you, you have to take a certain amount of heat or you don't, you know, that's just life, life as it were. Um, no, I think that, I, I mean, I like people, I like dealing with people, and I don't like it when people criticize me, but I don't fall apart either. And I think that people are very, very different. There are people who are just shyer or people who are, are more easily wounded. I mean, people, that's the great thing about being human is that people are so different. But I do think that that's a very good point is that some people are perhaps a little bit more able to brush off um, the criticism um, than, than others. I mean, not that it's easy and to say the least. The question is, how is the medical community beyond psychiatry doing with this? I think everybody in the medical community is doing a lot better than they were. I mean, you know, I think partly because there are effective treatments and eventually that catches up with the practice of medicine. The doctors prescribe medications and they see that they work and that kind of distributes itself in terms of knowledge um, amongst doctors or they get themselves treated, you know. So I think that in general, I, I've not been struck in my life that psychiatrists are uniquely compassionate on this. I mean, uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And some of, and some of my strongest support actually has been from surgeons and, and internists. You know, so I think, and certainly primarily from psychiatrists, from my colleagues, but it's, it's I, think that there's a, I think there's a lot more understanding in general. I still think there's a lot of, lot of prejudice. Thank you.